Good afternoon. It's uh, Thursday, the 5th of May, 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, and joining me today uh, is uh, Alex Thompson over Skype. Um, Alex, um, how are things in Holland? How's the weather? Well, a uh, beautiful day, which is just as well, because this is uh, a double bank holiday, well, double purpose bank holiday in the Netherlands. It's uh, Liberation Day, although that's no longer usually a, a bank holiday in the Netherlands, unless it's a, that the year ends in a zero or a five. It's the 71st anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands. And it also happens to be Ascension Day, which in much of the continent is a public holiday. So the sun is out and people are on the streets. Good stuff. Um, well, uh, let's get on with uh, war, because apparently in a world of instability, NATO is a linchpin for peace. This is according to uh, Philip Breedlove. Uh, you were suggesting Breed Hate was a more appropriate title. Yeah, so anyway, uh, what was he saying? Uh, he said, when I became Allied Commander Europe and Commander of the US European Command in May 2013, there was discussion in certain circles about the utility of NATO. I felt these discussions were completely without merit and there was no need to engage. My mind and the minds of the people who work in, around or with NATO, uh, the utility of the alliance is self-evident. There was tantamount to having a discussion, sorry, this was tantamount to having a discussion about the utility of the sun. Uh, the NATO alliance is arguably the most critical linchpin in supporting stability on the continent that is home to the world's largest integrated economy and incidentally on the continent that has in the past century or so spawned the world's most destructive conflicts. Our allies are on the front lines challenging Russian aggression, ungovern ungoverned and undergoverned spaces and the world's largest migrant crisis since World War II. It doesn't say anything about the fact that NATO created this uh, migrant crisis in the first place. Um, one of our newest ad uh, adaptation measures in NATO is the creation of the Very High Readiness Joint Task Force. This brigade-sized task force, with all necessary enablers, is ready for deployment anywhere in Europe at a moment's notice. It is anchored around brigades provided by non-US members of the Alliance. And he ends up by saying that NATO has been and will continue to be the centerpiece to peace uh, and stability in Europe. It is an institution indispensable in today's dangerous world. We Americans cannot stand alone. Our greatest strength is vested in our partners and allies who share our dreams, our values, and yes, shoulder to shoulder share our burdens. Uh, there's a certain level of hypocrisy in this. There certainly is a level of hypocrisy in it because, um, well, Remembrance Day, at least here in the Netherlands, is a good time to realise and remember that uh, US military doctrine uh, and UK military doctrine has always been about mutual defence and actually uh, declaring war on aggressors or responding to wars by aggressors. Now, we don't have aggressors uh, today. I'm not being naive here, but uh, what states are threatening to invade us? Um, there's a great danger of subversion from within our own countries by our own governments and people funded from our own taxpayers' money. Uh, I can't see much risk of states uh, invading us from outside right now. So you know, the, the purpose of NATO, as it's often been said, has gone wrong. I think it was about 2006, I saw Russian commentators starting to say in the press, certainly the Russian military press, um, that the Americans were trying to spin out, by, by which they mean, of course, the leading clique, not the American people or the Pentagon as a whole. They were trying to spin out NATO into a global NATO because otherwise it would lose its purpose. Well, uh, indeed. And of course, Russia is the country that they argue is about to invade us because, this, uh, because Putin's mad, uh, clearly. Uh, Russia's going to invade us and therefore we're going to create more troops put more troops into the uh, Eastern Europe, the Baltic region, into Poland perhaps, uh, and high-tech weapons as well? Yes, um, we've got the admission here in foreign policy, which is of course uh, the home journal of the, um, of the, of the clique around the, the Council on Foreign Relations and uh, all that crowd, Bilderbergers really. Uh, foreign policy is saying here um, that Russia is such a threat. And then they slip in, uh, we've already sent two US brigades to Russia's borders and there may be a third on its way and now we want more high-tech equipment. And if you read down that article, it mentions particularly missile defense shields. Now even 10 years ago, the Russians were saying, well, if you want to defend against Middle Eastern missiles, why do you put the uh, shield, so-called, in Poland. That's not quite the best place on the trajectory coming out of Iran, is it, when you have all these Middle Eastern allies? Um, and this leads on to uh, uh, Putin's defence here. Uh, we have 
uh, a YouTube clip. I, had, I don't have the title of the YouTube video to hand, but you'll find it on my Twitter feed if you see uh, my Twitter address at the bottom of the, the screen at the beginning of the program or elsewhere. Oh. There it is. Thank you. If you go to uh, that Twitter account, you'll see it from uh, a couple of days ago or yesterday, I think it was, that um, uh, Putin is actually saying in this video to uh, a journalist who is uh, basically a, a Soros man um, who, who pumps out nonsense about Putin every day. He says, well, you know, I was down in Sochi with Medvedev doing some preparations for the uh, Olympics and personally managing that the buildings were in order, which I don't think Western uh, political leaders do very often. And he said, I tuned into your show. I can't remember if it was while I was drifting off to sleep or in the morning. And I've never heard such rubbish. And he says you were you were spouting this line that it doesn't matter Obviously, he'd, he'd been given a script, this this uh, this shocked journalist who's there in the video looking completely unkempt. He says, he's obviously been given a script to read saying, it doesn't matter how close to our borders the Russians put their, that the Americans put their defence shield. He's, and this is um, the subtitle of the, of, the, of the moment of truth. He says, if you can put that on screen, that there are very basic things one cannot be aware of. Now, look at that classic... Um, you know, understated Putin uh, facial expression here. And he gives him a polite drubbing for three minutes, saying, are you really telling me that, uh, you know, if we have US defence shields, so-called, right up against our borders, that that makes no difference to Russian air defence? So if there's a war of aggression being planned, it's not by the Russians. Uh, no, but uh, they are reacting to it. So um, the, the FP article really pointing out comments that Ash, Ash Carter had made in Stuttgart uh, a couple of days ago. Um, but the Russians, in response, have decided that they need to uh, form new military division, uh, divisions and have them stationed along uh, the Russian borders. Um, Putin isn't stupid. He's not going to. He's not going to sit there and do nothing uh, while while NATO um, uh, behaves in this way. He's got to react to it. Um, as usual, he's doing it in a reasonably understated way, and he's doing it in response to something which has happened first. Um, but nonetheless, he can't do nothing. And this uh, has got to be a pretty dangerous uh, situation. It's massively dangerous. Um, as long as Putin's in control in Russia, I don't think we're going to see any silly business. But you know what we're often told with regard to what they call rogue states or uh, nuclear regimes in other parts of the world, in, in the Middle East or far, the Far East? They always say, who's the power behind the throne and what happens if the, the top man has a heart attack or a palace coup against him? Um, well, I don't think that's likely to happen to Putin. He seems to be in rude health and, and uh, control his own people very well. But uh, God forbid, you know, if, if he's uh, taken out the picture for any, any reason, then you've got to wonder, you know, what kind of people are going to uh, prevail in Russia? And, and you know, they, you, you wouldn't blame them for a much more aggressive posture, particularly as they're going to be strategically much less well versed in things than Putin himself is. Uh, and as we have discussed over the last couple of weeks, Alex, it's not just uh, NATO's activities as well, but if we look at what's going on in Georgia again, for example, and, and their attempts to sort of stoke up the Ossetian situation again, um, this is also of concern. It's a massive concern, uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia. These things don't go away. Uh, the Russians broadcast their intentions with regard to recognition of those republics as independent states before the West went ahead and recognized the independence of Kosovo from Serbia. So it was, if it's a tit for tat, it's always us that do uh, the first wrong move, really, the first provocation. Um, yet it's always presented as the Russians. Uh, absolutely. Um, and, uh, right, so. We'll have a look at this one now because obviously it's not just along the Russian border that, uh, that there is a problem because the Americans also trying to stoke up trouble in the South China Sea. Um, and so again, we've got a reaction. And in this case, it is China and Russia holding their first um, missile defense exercise. Now, <laughs> it's interesting that they are throwing uh, NATO's language back at it because every time NATO has had uh, one of its uh, exercises in recent, uh, in recent months, um, they've said, well, we're, we're basing our exercise around uh, some kind of uh, large aggressor in the Eurasian uh, theatre, depending on where they're having their exercise. Uh, but it's not uh, targeted at any particular uh, third party. Well, this is exactly what uh, the Russians and the Chinese have come back and said, that this new exercise does not target any third party. So they're, they're throwing NATO's uh, rhetoric straight back at them. Uh, and uh, so they're holding a joint computer-enabled anti-missile defence exercise later this month. Uh, it's a command and staff exercise. It's codenamed Aerospace Security 2016. It's going to be held uh, at the Russian Aerospace Defence Forces 
at the research center of the Russian Aerospace Defense Forces. And this is the first exercise of its kind, uh, which has been jointly held. Um, so again, uh, Russia and China can't not react to what the United States and NATO are doing. Um, but this is showing that uh, what the United States and NATO are doing is pushing Russia and China closer together towards cooperation in this area. It's uh, very top level stuff, this. The Chinese and Russians are historically suspicious of each other for obvious reasons. They're very different cultures and civilizations. They respect each other's grandeur. I mean, the first time they actually met on land was uh, a very complicated affair when the diplomatic protocol was so strained that the Russian envoy and the Chinese um, envoy, both representing emperors, um, had to prearrange that they would dismount their horses at, the, at the, exactly the same moment and shout their greetings over the top of each other so that there was no impression of inferiority of the one to the other. And then they haggled over which Siberian river should be their border because they you know, moved together uh, in the middle of Asia. And since that time, it's always been about Russian containment of Chinese population being greater and Chinese containment of Russian technology being better uh, or, or military vigor perhaps being greater. Um, and the peoples in between them have really just uh, accepted that they're not in that league and, and uh, been vassals to one or the other. And of course, that now is being stoked up with the belt of Turkic countries between being um, whipped up by certain elements of the CIA and a very complicated procedure. But it does seem that for a good long time now, the strategists in the city of London and in New York and Switzerland and wherever have had the view that the best way to destroy Russia in the end, since we've apparently tried four times to attack it from the West, we, rather the elite, have tried to attack it four times from the West and failed uh, to overthrow the Russian people's will and... and uh, because they fought to the death, they've they've recognised now that the that the idea is um, to stoke up the Chinese against the Russians in the end, uh, because obviously they have far superior numbers of men, and if they can ever be persuaded to hurl themselves at Russia, uh, that will be the end of of Russia. Is the thinking uh, that's uh, really what China and Russia are protecting against now? They have very different um, security postures otherwise, uh, and very different views of the world and different investment profiles in uh, other parts of the world, uh, but, but they're really being thrown together. Uh, and the West has, has caused it. Uh, indeed. Um, so, so do you I mean? Do you think, Alex? Do you think that is uh, is Western uh, elite policy? Uh, and in, in, if it is, what what do they expect as the outcome? I think that uh, the West realised that it will never ever swamp China. Uh, and there was a fear that the Chinese would swamp us. I mean, the Australians were talking in the seventies about the yellow peril and keeping them out of immigration. Uh, that has been realised, I, but I do think the West persists, even after four wars of aggression against Russia, uh, using the Germans as the proxies, but the Anglo-Saxons as the brains, really. Um, the, the aim has been, well, Russia's manageable, we have ridiculously thought. Napoleon made this mistake. It seems that Lord Milner Group, that the Milner Group made the mistake as well, um, that the Russians can be defeated. No, they can't. Well, they might look like us. Um, they might seem to be part of Christendom, which they very much are, probably more than we are now. Uh, but they have uh, this doctrine, which makes them more Asian than, than European, that the nation is above the interests of the individual. And also that there are such things as multi-generational planning. And in that regard, they're like the Chinese. In fact, on the eve of the First World War, a Russian poet called Alexander Bloch wrote a poem called Skifi, the Scythians in uh, English, which is all about comparing the Russians with this ancient uh, tribe on the steppe. Uh, where Russia now is, the Scythian tribe, and saying, we, uh, you know, we, we show you our friendly European face, but if you attack us, we'll bear down upon you like an Asiatic horde. So it really is Russia saying, come on, if, if you want to provoke us, then, then, then we'll, we'll you know, live up to expectations and uh, fight back, but uh, be prepared for it. Yes. Um, well, uh, Kerry, in the meantime, uh, it's quite interesting because... Uh, if you look at what John Kerry's done over the last couple of years, he's, he's been going around trying to pretty much undo everything that Hillary Clinton did before him. Uh, but this, uh, so in this sense, this is a bit unlike him, but he's clearly been given instructions. Um, and he's uh, warning Assad that he's got to start getting ready to leave uh, office by the 1st of August or else is pretty much what's being said, according to this headline. Uh, Kerry was saying, if Assad's strategy is to somehow think he's going to just carve out Aleppo, and carve out a section of the country. I've got news for him. The war doesn't. This war doesn't end. It's simply physically impossible for Assad to just carve out an area and pretend that he's somehow going to make it safe. 
while the underlying issues are unresolved in this war. As long as Assad is in there, the opposition is not going to stop fighting it one way or the other. Uh, he said that the target date for transition, as he's calling it, was the 1st of August. And he said, uh, so we're now coming up to May. Either something happens in these next few months uh, or they're asking for a different, very different track uh, from the United States. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, on the 3rd of May, uh, Sergei Lavrov held a press conference uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, talking about uh, the ceasefire in Syria and how um, Jabhat al-Nusra uh, was being protected there. And he was saying, during the negotiations, our US partners actually tried to draw the borders of this zone of silence to include a significant number of positions occupied by al-Nusra. We managed to exclude this uh, as it is absolutely unacceptable. He said, uh, this indicates that someone wants to use the Americans. Uh, I do not believe that it's in their interest to shield al-Nusra that somebody wants to use the Americans to shield the al Nusra front from strikes. Uh, and this was in a, in a uh, comment that he made to Sputnik. Um, this is uh, quite an interesting, quite interesting language again from Lavrov, from, from a Russian, because he's, he's basically saying the United States was working to protect the terrorists in Syria. Um, but he's, uh, he's also suggesting that somebody else was perhaps influencing them to do so without actually stating who that was. Um, so he's not 100% putting the blame at America's door, but he's making quite clear uh, that the West is, uh, is trying to protect uh, Jabhat al-Nusra uh, and terrorists in Syria. Lavrov is the consummate diplomat. He's far and away the uh, most skilled and one of the most longest serving foreign ministers in the world. And he'll never directly blame the Americans. And he'll always make a point of saying our American partners, as in that quotation. A lot of this seems to revolve around the city of Aleppo itself, where I've uh, walked around. It's uh, one of the most upsetting things uh, I've ever thought about, actually, is what's happened to the um, the people in the Armenian quarter who showed me around. Uh, that really was uh, you know, the coexistence and, and cradle of civilizations, Aleppo. Even the city name in Arabic is Halab, which means he milked because uh, all three monotheistic religions hold that it's the place where Abraham stopped and uh, held his herds and uh, you know, literally milked his herds. It's, it's a very, very symbolic place, uh, especially the citadel there. And you know, we've seen in the last week a lot of claim and counterclaim about exactly who perpetrated the particularly monstrous uh, bombardment of central Aleppo recently. Uh, I get the sense that uh, you know when Kerry talks about... Um, the opposition will always fight back. Um, there will be no safe zone around uh, Aleppo for the regime. That's not a, a prediction. That's a threat. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, of course, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that we've been highlighting recently has been, uh, particularly, the activities of the BBC and certain uh, arms of the BBC in foreign countries, including Kazakhstan and, and Syria and other places. Uh, well, the Guardian now has uh, basically. Uh, also lifted the lid on this in a certain respect, Britain funding the propaganda war, they say, against ISIS in Syria. Um, what's the detail of this? The detail is uh, a couple of company names are given, uh, typical kind of acronym names that mean nothing, which uh, one-man bands t tend to give themselves as names when they set up as consultancies. Um, the basic story is that uh, what we're told for public consumption is that the FCO is out of conflict resolution funds uh, training up citizen journalists. And you covered this in those in the past, Mike, and certainly Vanessa has the white helmets and all that nonsense. But behind the FCO facade, once the contract's awarded, uh, gentlemen who've, most, who've recently left the MOD at the rank of colonel or whatever, and uh, from questionable parts of the army, shall I say, and, and, and well, I shouldn't, shouldn't denigrate the army, but I think you know what I mean, uh, uh, gentlemen of questionable tactics uh, with questionable specialisms, better used against real enemies, will then be given uh, that funding and go off with the chaps uh, in Syria, make these little videos of... Um, you know, cute opposition men, um, you know, endearingly firing their RPGs and their man pads. And these videos are then sent off to the Pentagon. It's very much written as the junior partner in the, in the NATO thing again, uh, because the Pentagon needs to see evidence that the Brits have spent their money well. Uh, it's, it's a very cynical setup. And a, a number of uh, names and company organization and organizational names are given in this report, which are worth a follow up, I would say. And I, I'm startled that it's The Guardian and not The Telegraph that's blown the, the whistle on this. Probably the Guardian doesn't think it's blowing the whistle. Like it probably thinks it's, it's beating the drum and saying, you know, what, what, a, what a good little uh, contribution Britain is making to, to fighting the famous spectre ISIS. 
which leads us on yes. to the previous spectre. Um, how many times this year have we heard people with their um, their heads in gear saying, "Hang on, Al Al Qaeda were out for our throats," and suddenly they have them, you know, they've gone quiet and they're not doing anything? Well, Al Qaeda has been resurrected, and I think Vanessa has said that the um, the coastal strip of southern Yemen being held is actually being held notionally in the name of Al Qaeda. Well, we're going to come on to that in a moment. Yes, absolutely. Well, here's something else Al Qaeda has done. Um, an emirate in two uh, countries, uh, Syria and Iraq, well, of course, these supposed Islamists don't respect borders, but um, for ISIS to set up an emirate in two territories is, is perhaps not on. Perhaps it's it's part of not, you know, a gentleman's agreement between them. Uh, and perhaps suddenly they've respected the line in the sand drawn by Sykes Pico again. But whatever it is, it's not ISIS who's going to set up an emirate in northern Syria. No, it's Al Qaeda uh, returning to the stage before their first action in, ooh, a good many years. I mean, geopolitically, they haven't been active supposedly since what, 2003, three, four. Yes. They just popped out of the box again. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, what's uh, what's going on in Turkey then, Alex? This is a shocker. Uh, this is six months old. It's from Hürriyet Daily News, and it's about the Turkish president Erdogan bestowing tradesmen with a policing mission. I stumbled across it when I was researching uh, for actually for a speech on Turkey recently, uh, and before I forget to say. Um, Last night was Dutch Remembrance Day, which they always hold on literally on the eve of Liberation Day. And I went to the city's war memorial here, and as usual, the mayor gave a very decent speech. But at the point where he said, um, many Syrians, especially a lot of children, are now refugees, and we think of these poor people because we had an amazing number of refugees across Europe and here in the Netherlands in uh, 1940 to 45. And he mentioned the Syrians. Uh, a very a very decent mayor he is, by the way, although he mentioned the EU a couple of times as the saviour of society, but I'll let that go. Uh, and at this point, a gentleman of 60 or so, you know, a typical reserve Dutchman, uh, didn't know me from Adam, looked at me and felt the needs, and he was a bit emotional, actually, to say about this Syrian stuff, he was whispering because the mayor's speech is going on, about this Syrian stuff, the Turks, we are being told, are our allies. Are you supposed to believe that? So that is what even quite reserved conservative Dutchmen are thinking now. Uh, they're very worried about Turkey. And here's a little uh, indication of what Erdogan's renewed caliphate is going to be about. Uh, there's, there's stuff in this speech. Here we are. In our civilization, in our national and civilizational spirit, tradesmen and artisans, which he later describes, uh, uh, he says the modern day tradesman is a taxi driver or, or a, you know, a clothing store owner, are soldiers when needed. When needed. And he gives them this Turkish historical name, Alperenler, uh, which is basically crusading knights or the Muslim version thereof. They are martyrs, veterans and heroes defending their homeland. When they... I mean, he's got some kind of 14th century view of Turkey, hasn't he? Yeah. They are the policemen who build order when needed. Just imagine that. They are the judge and referees who deliver justice when needed. So in his renewed caliphate, he doesn't want to have courts you know, who, who are sworn to defend the constitution in a secular sense. Uh, he obviously wants friendly local big men uh, with the appropriate moustache and pistol in the holster, perhaps, to be called out of their taxi rank or their um, um, haberdashery shop uh, to basically act as judge and jury in disputes. Some kind of Wild West sheriff idea. Well, uh, indeed. Let's let's move on to Yemen, because uh, you, you mentioned that a second ago. And Vanessa has uh, published a new article in 21st Century War. Uh, the US mission creep escalates as 100 US rangers uh, land in Laj, uh, and she's saying reports have come in this morning from Al Misra TV of a US troop buildup in southern Yemen. 100 US Rangers uh, have landed in Laj, close to the ISIS and Al Qaeda um, controlled port of Aden. Uh, this arrival was followed by the arrival of four US planes car carrying military equipment and supplies. Uh, it, this began. This operation began last week. Uh, when a reported eight or ten U.S. Rangers combined with uh, UAE forces to ostensibly drive uh, Al Qaeda out of Al Mukalla areas of southern Yemen, uh, the Western media failed to report on this inter uh, intervention as it was happening. And finally, on the 24th of April, the New York Times published an account. Um, from reports on the ground and from the, reading the New York Times report, we can conclude that despite claims of U.S. involvement being to com combat the al-Qaeda threat in the region, in reality the militants offered little or no resistance and simply handed over the al makala base to the uh, UAE and U.S. forces. So um, the question is, what is the relationship between um, 
uh, the US, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Al-Qaeda. Um, we know that uh, Saudi was uh, pretty much responsible for creating Al-Nusra Front in, in Syria. Um, do you think there's the same type of operation going on uh, in Yemen here? I would say so, Mike, because these nations are nowadays very, very specialist in how they wage war. All the Gulf nations, uh, I mean, Dubai, for example, is just a cesspit, but a very rich cesspit. Uh, Afghan drugs, Russian whores all end up there. Um, you no know, uh, Westerners of questionable uh, intention, as well as a lot of expats who are just trying to uh, you know, have a nice learner there. Um, what, you asked what the role of each country is. Well, it's fairly straightforward. If you look at the last 15 years, the uh, 100 or so Americans are going to be the trainers wearing the sunglasses. They're not going to go out of base much, uh, except perhaps to fraternize with, with uh, local girls. That usually happens. Um, the UAE is going to provide the money and the, uh, perhaps the transport. Uh, the Saudis are going to provide the ideology. Yes. OK, let's move on to um, the EU military. Um, we highlighted this article a couple of days ago, and the point I was making was that, uh, of course, this is not a secret German plot. Uh, this, uh, because Britain and France w really began this, this sort of uh, uh, conjunction of, of uh, military forces and these, these uh, defence agreements. Um, here we were talking about uh, German and Dutch forces uh, combining. Uh, but the point you wanted to highlight from this article was just a one-liner really saying uh, it's also emerged that the Czech Republic has started talks to have its be army become part of Germany's army. Um, now, that's an interesting uh, development. I'm kicking myself that I didn't pro uh, predict this, so I could have said I told you so, but I was um, thinking for the last 10 days or so after we started highlighting the German-Dutch linkage, which the Express has now got hold of with the bit between its teeth, I was thinking uh, I bet the Czechs are next. And, well, you'll have to just take it from me. Um, I hope you believe me that I was going to say it. Why? Because uh, in 1940-41, well, 40 is the crucial year, of course. Um, uh, in fact, 1939 in the case of the Czechs. Um, the Wehrmacht encountered unexpectedly fierce resistance to the east and to the west in one country only in each direction. It was the Netherlands here where the unexpected fierce resistance happened in May 1940. And the National uh, War Memorial is actually not in Amsterdam, but on the mountain by the banks of the Rhine, where this resistance was put up for five days, Krebeberg. And so many uh, Wehrmacht soldiers were killed that um, they, Hitler actually, out of embarrassment, ordered the Germans to be disinterred and buried somewhere else to, to, uh, uh, to hide the fact. Uh, so that very fierce resistance there, because they were a well-equipped army, they were just not, not funded properly because the, the Dutch political class couldn't believe, didn't want to believe that they would be invaded, despite intelligence. Uh, now, to the east, the Czechs were by far the best army. And uh, after the Sudetenland was lost, they, they dug in in their emplacements. Uh, and they were just run over like a steamroller, but with very, very fierce fighting. So that's the, that's the historical reason, really. That I, I think that, just as my father used to say, you know, that, that these European nations around Germany have decided to cling on to its underbelly instead of stand up to it again. The French um, one-liner is, you know, after you've had Verdun, then sometimes you, you, you capitulate and, and do a Vichy to avoid a re repetition of Verdun. Um, the other reason, I think, why this is substantial is that the Czechs are you know, quite Germanic in their organisation. Uh, they're very Central European, not at all Eastern European in their mentality. And crucially... Uh, Brian was talking about how uh, different parts of the Europe, uh, European Union were allowed to be uh, to specialise in certain military functions and let the rest rot away so that they were only interoperable and not independent anymore. Uh, the Czechs have a particular focus on a CBRN warfare, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear. Uh, they're generally acknowledged to have certainly continental Europe's best CBRN capacities. And I think that uh, if we're going to have a, a beast emerging, it's going to need at least you know one arm that... that uh, uh, deals with that kind of warfare. If that's the case, then it would imply that this uh, EU army is going to be deployed to you know, rogue or nasty states, which may uh, either fire or plausibly be said to have fired chemical weapons, which may in fact uh, have been uh, sent by um, Western-backed forces, as in Syria. Um, well, this is a good point. Now, something that we've been pointing out for months is that uh, when you look at the various defence reviews that have taken place in the various European countries, um, it's been clear that, that the various uh, um, sort of military areas have been split up between the various countries. Um, Steve Barnes in the chat box was pointing out that Cameron said at committee yesterday that, uh, that he didn't want an EU army, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say that's a lie. Uh, he's lying because uh, Jean-Claude Jean -Claude Juncker has been making it clear for over a year 
with any so-called re renegotiation in the uh, relationship between Britain and the European Union would include uh, European army structure. Um, and the fact of the matter is that um, it was David Cameron that announced the first um, sort of European defence pact, which is between Britain and France in 2010. As soon as he became prime minister, within a couple of days of him becoming prime minister, he announced this uh, without any debate in Parliament. And it was us uh, that highlighted the fact that this defence pact had come about through the operations of the Franco-British Council. So Cameron, he must be lying. Alex. Yeah. Um as with everyone, and uh, you know, certainly politicians, look at what they do, not what they say. Uh, Cameron can say, I don't want. He can, just as he said, the th uh, I don't want prisoners voting. The thought of prisoners voting makes me physically sick. And of course, the Continentals laughed him to all the way to the European Court of Justice, uh, or the, well, the ECHR, I think it was in that case. Uh, but never mind that. Uh, what does Cameron want is not really the key question. The question is what the Cameron's backers want. Uh, Brian has never tired of saying that Cameron's uh, main financial backer for his personal campaign, uh, well covered by Peter Hitchens, by the way, the 2005 campaign for him to become Conservative Party leader while in opposition. Uh, his key backer was uh, a Finn called Poyo Zabludovic, who's an arms dealer with Israeli ties. Um, that's where you need to look if you want to, to see what the, 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 the Conservative government, or indeed any government, at the moment it's Conservatives, what they want. You look at the backers of the leadership campaigns. Uh, well, in the meantime, we have uh, more military brass coming out and, and basically admitting that the European army is inevitable. In this case, is Colonel Richard Kemp. He's saying if Britain stays in the EU, it's inevitable. Uh, this was in a letter to the Times. He said, if Britain remains in the EU, e sorry, if Britain remains in the EU and we will sign up to a European army, no matter what our political leaders tell us today, the referendum will be seen as a mandate for the ever closer union uh, that so many are working towards. Um, but he said that uh, uh, if we were to leave, that that could scupper the project. Uh, and uh, so Germany is pushing hard for the creation of a European army. Well, it's, n it's not Germany, as we've just hinted. Germany is certainly part of it. Uh, but uh, is it the main driver? I don't think it is. Um, and he said that few European countries take defence seriously, with Britain one of the small number that meet the, the NATO spending requirement of 2% of GDP. EU members. Uh, EU member states will see an EU army not only as a chance to consolidate power in an EU super state, but also a way of cutting back further on defence uh, spending. Well, um, so that's his point of view. Um, yeah. But in the meantime, Alex, uh, we've got others coming out of the woodwork to make uh, increasingly uh, threats against the UK if we were to leave. Yes, uh, this is a German, if I'm not mistaken, Christoph Meyer. Uh, he may be Austrian. I didn't have the time to look him up. But he's at King's College London, and to the Telegraph's given him a platform to say why Brexit would make the UK less secure. Um, just on that point of, of are the Germans pushing it, um, in this case, EU military um, expansion, integration, I'm increasingly of the opinion, and have been for some time, that, that the Germans are constitutionally unable uh, to push anything because of the way that the United States has, has managed them for a very long time. So uh, thanks to a Canadian viewer who emailed us this week, we may actually get into some more details. So uh, and thanks to our Canadian viewer for putting us onto that. Now, this article by uh, Meyer on why Brexit would make the UK less secure has a couple of points about NATO, which uh, I'm guessing is um, really a way of trying to counteract the uh, prevailing Brexit dialogue that it's the it's NATO, not the EU, that guarantees our security. I think there is a real desire now to kind of make it uh, a reality that the EU really does uh, guarantee our security, or that if you remove um, the EU, you won't have any security. That seems to be the the plan now. Now I'll read a bit of what Meyer is saying. Uh, he says some analysts discount, if not completely deny, the past contribution of the EU. UK security, right? So Meyer is saying that uh, the EU provides. Yet 70 years of relevance in Europe were not simply due to NATO, but also required the process of European integration, and going on about the Franco German axis and so on, as if you know, the EU has really guaranteed our peace. And then he says, even those who argue that the EU was wrong to offer Ukraine an association agreement, that's paragraph two we're coming up to now have to acknowledge that the EU now has, that's the key, now has significant power 
badly edited this, he's, he's left out the word too, but a significant power to solve as well as create security problems that become highly relevant to NATO. Well, there's two grammatical howlers or typos in one sentence from a, from a King's College professor. Not very good, is it? But the whole point is he'd been given a, a platform to say, um, basically sniggering behind his hand, all you who have said that NATO is our security guarantor and not EU, you are soon going to be proved wrong and it's going to be a real kick in your teeth. <sighs> Indeed. Uh, OK, uh, let's move on. Alex, um, tell us about this one. Uh, Sven Marie is the Belgian advocate who has uh, decided or, or been asked to defend uh, Abdeslam, who is the supposed ringleader of the uh, recent Brussels attacks. And he's told Libération, a French paper, because Abdeslam has now been extradited to France, uh, what he thinks of Abdeslam's capacity. Um, bear in mind, this is the supposed ringleader. Uh, this is very much like uh, the uh, Chechens in Boston case, uh, really, the um, uh, being the patsies, uh, you know, and, and not able to mastermind anything. Uh, do you have the yeah, uh, there quotation? Go. There we are, yes. This is my translation. Uh, it's ruder in the French. Uh, he says, and he's prepared to say this publicly, he, Abdeslam, the ringleader, is a little Molenbeek toe rag from the petty crime class, more a follower than a ringleader. He has the intelligence of an empty ashtray. There's an abysmal vacuity about him. He's the perfect example of the grand theft auto generation that think they're living in a video game. I asked him if he'd ever read the Quran. He replied that he'd got his interpretation of it from the internet. That's just fine for these simpletons. The net is just about the most they can take in. Now, this is screaming to me, Patsy. You know, that the guy is, is not thinking clearly. He may even be mind controlled. Yes, OK. <laughs> well, what can you say about that? Uh, right, uh, just uh, slight... Uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to put that up. Uh, just a reminder that tonight, actually possibly not a reminder because maybe you didn't know if you haven't been looking at Ian Crane's Facebook page, but tonight, um, because ba Monday was a bank holiday, we decided we would do Ian's programmes this evening. Crane reported 7.30. We're talking about the uh, uh, coming financial collapse, uh, fracking nightmare at 9 o'clock. Uh, Ian will be joined by Mel Kelly, um, because of course uh, in Scotland today is the uh, Scottish elections. Uh, they're expecting a full uh, complement of SNP victories uh, for the Scottish Parliament. Uh, they'll be talking about that and other uh, fracking related issues in Scotland. Um, now, let's, uh, we're sort of running out of time, Alex, so let's, uh, let's move along a little bit. Uh, but we've got uh, the two party system here. Is it broken? Philip Johnson uh, realises that uh, there is a problem and wonders how it ever will be broken, but fails to mention anything about uh, the reasons of, in terms of party funding and media funding. He provides a link in the article to a new campaign. I think it's called a campaign for a free parliament or a fair parliament. Yeah, uh, yes, there, there, here we have it here. This, uh, here this is a free parliament. So, what, is, so this is uh, Lord Digby, your Lord Digby... Jones, Jones yes. yes, sorry. Of the, uh, of the CBI fame. Um, quite a Blairite in, in the past, wasn't he? Um, that's my first question mark about this. And my second is, um, if you've identified as a group calling yourself campaign for a free parliament that our current MPs are all stooges uh, and unable to debate and uninterested in representing us, and certainly I see evidence of that every day, I'm sure we all do, uh, then how on earth do you think the solution, Lord Digby Jones, is to provide money? The whole point is funding is corrupting. You know, if, if you want to put independence in Parliament, then how about we get off our backsides and stand on soapboxes and actually address people locally and persuade enough voters to vote for us? Now, that, that's uh, the ideal. Well, it's more than the ideal. It's, the, it's what we need to go back to. Uh, Hilaire Belloc actually wrote, wrote a book called The Party System, well worth a read. He was a Frenchman who uh, came into Britain and became an MP and wrote about the fact that before 1800, we and the Americans didn't have parties and our, our democracies, or republics they really were, functioned perfectly well then. And that's before the corruption came in. Yes. Uh, okay, well, let's uh, move on to TTIP. Sorry we're having to move through this a little bit uh, quickly here, but uh, <clears throat> anti-Americanism apparently is uh, fueling fears over the uh, TTIP pact in yes, Germany. 
the Financial Times, of course, is, is calling this a sob story and pointing the finger at the Germans for being anti-American, which is always a good thing to call the Americans if you're a journalist. Um, but if, if you can get a, a read of the full article, it's, it's a bit unpredictable how you can uh, access Financial Times without paying. But I managed to read the whole article. Um, it's just basically saying uh, silly Germans need to get over themselves and realise that the Americans are going to make their lives better with TTIP. So there is obviously some kind of desperation over the plummeting of German support from TTIP. If I, if I remember right, it's gone down from 55% to 17% support in Germany. Um, well, uh, on the reading FT articles, uh, I mean, I couldn't encourage anybody uh, to do this because, I mean, it wouldn't be right. But, uh, you know, if you type the headline into Google um, and uh, click on the Google link, you can normally get access to the article without having to take a subscription. Um, this is uh, being covered in, in, in Europe as well. Yes, uh, Belgium is completely federalised now, so uh, the Belgian parliament doesn't actually take its own positions on treaties. It is guided, it, it binds itself to be guided, uh, dictated to by the regional parliaments. And the most socialistic and sceptical about TTIP is, of course, the French-speaking region of Wallonia. And the Walloon parliament in January, I've never seen the outcome of this, but the day before, the European commissioner, uh, Cecilia Wallström of, of Sweden, who's, who's who negotiating TTIP, or writing it. The day before she came to speak to the Walloon Parliament, she knew it would be a hostile audience. Uh, they actually put online the questions they wished to ask her. And the crucial ones were these. Are you going to give Belgian MPs a vote on TTIP? And are you going to let multinationals co-write our laws? And they explained what they were going on about. Uh, and the main point they had is that there has been a dress rehearsal for TTIP, uh, a Canadian um, EU uh, agreements called the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreements, or CETA, C-E-T-A, which has been hammered out between Canada and the EU at bureaucrat level, but still hasn't been voted on by Parliament or any of those niceties. And the Walloon parliamentarians were wanting to, uh, were wanting to ask Mrs Malmström, why on earth is it that when the Canadians suggested employment law protections, that your European Commission said, absolutely not, we are not going to have any employment employee protections in this free trade deal? And this is the dress rehearsal for TTIP. Yes. <clears throat> I also see one more thing quick, briefly on that before we run out of time, uh, that the Walloon MPs, they're, they're, they're socialists, but they're, they're very good MPs. Um, they've realised that TTIP defines no such thing as um, critical national infrastructure. In French, they call it les services d'intérêt général, so uh, services of general interest that everyone has a stake in. There is, there is no such thing as uh, infrastructure that cannot be subjected to corporatism. Uh, railways, no. Water supplies, no. None of these things. Tell us about this one. Yeah, TAFTA is the French acronym for TTIP. And here we have uh, a Parisian professor of economics saying right there in the headline that the idea that we're going to have a boost to our purchasing power through signing TTIP, uh, both here and in North America, is a massive lie, un vaste mensonge. And that's from the same paper that... Uh, interviewed Abdeslam's lawyer, Liberation. I uh, expect it will be closed down by hordes of French riot police soon under the state of emergency. Um, and uh, the state of emergency we mentioned a couple of days ago has now been extended. Uh, and This is something you predicted months ago that this was going to happen. It was just going to continue to be extended. So they've decided to extend it past the uh, point of the uh, Euro 2016 football championships. Uh, what's the next excuse, do you think? Um, it could be another attack on French soil. It could be that the French, the current strategy seems to be just keep hosting convenient international events, uh, conferences or, or sports events. And then two or three months either side of it, you can bracket off and call, uh, you know, uh, constitution free months. So if you have enough of those months in a year, then you're covered, aren't you? <laughs> Indeed. Um, right. Well, one subject we've been uh, working very hard on in the background is the National Health Service. We're going to have a lot more uh, about it uh, in the coming days and months, but of course the National Health Service uh, being used as uh, uh, sort of uh, an excuse for the anti-TTIP campaigners, rightly so in many respects, but I think one of the things that uh, the anti-TTIP campaigners uh, are missing uh, while they focus on TTIP is the fact that the NHS is being destroyed already, never mind what's, what might happen as a result of TTIP. Uh, so we want to, uh, to bring uh, this little organization uh, to your attention. Uh, thank you very much to the person who sent us, a, uh, who contacted us about this. Um, and uh, this is all about being a health and care radical, uh, about how change starts with 
me, the individual, if I'm working in the health service. And this is from the School for Health and Care Radicals. Um, and uh, who is uh, the team who is behind uh, the School for Health and Care Radicals? Well, it's led by Helen Bevan, a uh, common purpose uh, graduate extraordinaire, and you'll find lots of common purpose in this, uh, in this little group. Um, and uh, let's see a little bit about them. Welcome to the School for Health and Care Radicals. Uh, this is a global community of change agents. 7,000 people have now taken part in the School for Health and Care Radicals uh, program from around the world. And you can see the countries there, uh, Argentina, Australia, Italy, Netherlands, Pakistan, Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, Switzerland, United States, as well as England and Wales, um, a whole bunch of countries. Uh, and you can get a certificate. You can become certificated uh, as a change agent uh, if you want to be. This is fantastic. Uh, and disruption is the new normal. So uh, we're going to disrupt everything, disrupt everything that's good, never mind everything that's bad. Um, but Alex, this was really the, the kicker for me um, because the network of secret, the network secrets of great change agents is that as a change agent, my centrality in the, information, in the informal network is more important than my position in the formal hierarchy. Uh, and if you want to create small uh, scale change, you work through a cohesive network and so on. So it's all about building networks, but this whole business that the informal network is more important than the formal hierarchy. Uh, who then takes responsibility when something goes wrong? Well, yes, uh, if, if you've got hierarchy, you've got responsibility. The left-hand graph there, which is the boo, ya boo sucks old way of doing things, is designed for divisions. In other words, reporting to a manager who tells you what to do, uh, as in the military, uh, apparently that's going to cause division. Well, of course, it's called the division of power, isn't it, to avoid absolutism. Um, what they're describing is subversion. Now, according to Wikipedia, which is everyone's go-to source these days, subversion is a process by which the values and principles of a system in place are contradicted or reversed. So there's no need to abolish the current bosses. You just contradict them while they're in post. More specifically, subversion can be described as an attack on the public morale and the will to resist intervention are the product of combined political and social class loyalties. Oh, this is a quotation from um, Social Justice Warrior. And in a good sentence here from Wikipedia, subversion is used as a tool to achieve political goals, political note, this is political, although it's healthcare, because it generally carries less risk, cost and difficulty than open warfare. Now, I know one of the young ladies who's gone through that um, healthcare radical training in Georgia. She was a sweet uh, student of English of mine. And at the time, she was very pious and took me to the Georgian Orthodox Church and said, here we have some wonder working icons and there's our lovely patriarch. And then she went to California, where I think she was got at, and then she came back and, to my astonishment, said, um, I hate the Georgian Orthodox Church. I want to change this country from top to bottom. And she now describes herself on her professional profiles as a change agent and proud of it. Uh, so what we're talking about is, is complete brainwashing here? Yes. Uh, California, brainwashing, NLP. Um, you know, it, the churches have that as well in California. Name it and claim it theology. So whether you're getting at it through psychology or religion doesn't really matter. It's, it's the same ideas and the same people and the same geographical locales. Um, well, I just want to highlight once again this article. And now if you're campaigning uh, against TTIP on the basis of its potential effect on the NHS, again, I would say to you, the effect on the NHS is happening already. Never mind what might happen after TTIP comes along. If you haven't seen this article yet, please have a look at it. It, uh, it, it was written before we came across this, this, uh, this little organization we've just been discussing. Um, nonetheless, uh, it's absolutely clear what is going on uh, within the NHS. Please read that and distribute it as far and wide as you can. Um, just a, a quick one to end, uh, end on before we go to the book spot, Alex, uh, and that is this uh, from Donald Trump. Uh, and he's uh, talking about 47,055 uh, Americans dying of a drug overdose last year, 4,000 every month. And as he rightly highlights here, um, uh, many, many people in the United States and not in the, tr the traditional uh, demographic either. Uh, this is now heading into the white middle class uh, areas of the United States. Many, many people dying of heroin overdoses. Uh, and of course, Trump then calling to build the wall because he's saying the solution to this is uh, to build a wall and stop the drugs coming into the country in the first place. Um, surely he's missing a trick here. Uh, the issue isn't the availability of drugs. 
the issue is the despair that people are facing, even in middle class America at the moment, about the state of the economy, the state of their health care, uh, and the state of the country. And certainly this, this seems to me building a wall is treating a symptom, it's not treating the disease. If you're ever in the US uh, as a viewer um, and you want to see what has happened, then quite within quite easy reach of New York, Philadelphia and Washington is the state of West Virginia. And that is yeah, the epicenter of drug abuse. Uh, and besides, they don't need any Latin American cocaine imported uh, by dubious agencies um, in order to you know, get high and wreck themselves. They do it with crystal meth these days cooked up in their kitchen. Um, the place is an absolute wreck. It's, it's, it's as bad as the worst post-industrial parts of France and, and Belgium. It really is. And it's within stone's throw of Washington. So um, it's, it's, it's a disaster. By the way, uh, Trump may be well-intentioned. He may not. But the trouble is um, aircraft can fly over walls. And you need to look at who's flying the aircraft full of drugs into the country anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely right. OK, uh, we'll end on the book spot. Uh, taken. Yes, I've only just come across this. It's a spectacular book uh, from very early on. Her case was 2003 when most people were still not aware of the uh, the family court gulag uh, and the, the wide scale abuses. And she was a very, very switched on author. So I think it may be a pseudonym, but she called herself Sue O'Callaghan. Uh, it's, she was in an affluent West London family uh, in that time. Uh, an awful husband controlled by his uh, evil scheming mother. Uh, who pulled establishment strings, but by a series of almost miraculous coincidences, such as getting a real nice policewoman on her case, um, who knew she shouldn't be confiscating these children, and having uh, legal aid, which is now being taken away, of course, uh, and having a very good uh, silk fighting for her, she did manage to persuade the High Court judges that the original judgments had been obtained by deception by social services. Uh, and finally, in this very English way, all the school, school mothers and... Uh, uh, others around her who had known she was perfectly decent but were afraid of her because of what had happened, the theft of her children, suddenly rallied round at the last moment when the tide was turning and saying, well, we've always believed in you, really. And then they set up a nice church rota to uh, to shop for her so she didn't have to cook for three months. Uh, all very hypocritical modern British stuff. Um, it, it shows how corrupt we've become, uh, but also that there are still some very good people in the courts uh, and in social services even, although not very many. And the key quote from the book, is uh, this is it applies if you go through the civil law routes uh, others apply common law and say you know uh, you've you've stolen my children that's a tort give them back i can't recommend that i'm not a lawyer but i know some do but if you go through the, the route of responding in a civil case as the respondent your options are limited and she says if you take that route then having your children returned through the court is dependent on the skill expertise and experience of the legal team employed it's quite sad really because she is a 0.1 percent outcome as far as i'm concerned she was well briefed had an excellent team everything went right for her she got a friendly female judge a uh, friendly policewoman and even so she only did it by the skin of her teeth after three rounds of stealing her children back against court orders uh it's it's a despair but, but the, you know the exception proves the rule uh, the odds are so stacked against the the parents uh, when their children are stolen absolutely uh well thank you very much alex for joining us um We'll hopefully see you uh, next week at some point. Uh, Brian is uh, at the uh, at a conference on that that exact subject today. Sorry about that. Um, in uh, in Scotland, uh, he will be flying back tomorrow, but it'll just be me and David Scott tomorrow. Uh, Brian will be back on the program on Monday. Um, hope to see you at one o'clock tomorrow. Thanks for joining us, uh, and thanks again, Alex.